if there's one core idea that actually unites all three of the branches of math that we're talking about in this course is that linearity is important. Linearity is central to linear algebra. It was central in calculus because we were doing these linear approximations. And now we have these expected values. They're also linear operations. Uh, so I got some advice once from a physicist friend that if I wanted to understand mathematics, I should take a long bubble bath and meditate on linearity. <laughs> and that turned out to be really great advice. Nice. I need to try that. Yeah. Um, let me know how that goes. Welcome back to the final exercise session for the Math for ML class. Today's session is on probability. And I am, as always, your host, Charles. And with me today, I have ML engineer at Weights and Biases, Scott Condren. Hello. Working through the exercises. Hey, Scott. All right. Probability is a, one of the tougher components of the math of ML. And there's like lots of really deep ideas. So understanding it from its fundamentals can be really challenging. I'm going to try and focus then as much as possible on the ideas that we most need for machine learning and in particular ideas around entropy and information theory. All right. Let's, let's dive right in, Scott. This first section here on representing probability distributions, this is a nice little set of exercises just to firm up this idea of probability mass functions and also probability density functions. There's like some text there. It's worth reading and playing with these exercises, but I'm actually just, let's just skip past these. They're relatively straightforward. If you have any questions, you can post about them on our community, on the channel, we'll answer them. But these are pretty straightforward. I want to get into the more exciting and interesting stuff here with Scott. So go past this section on probability density functions and here. There we go. Surprise and machine learning loss functions. Scott, in working in machine learning, I would guess you've come across things like the cross entropy before. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. What about like the entropy or the KL divergence? Are those familiar ideas or unfamiliar ideas? Those are more ideas I would have seen mentioned, but certainly haven't gone deep into. Great. Yeah, so we'll talk about them a, a little bit here. We won't go into incredible detail about what these things are. I think it's a good way to get more intuition about them and why they behave the way they do and why we're using them in machine learning in greater detail. But at least for the exercises here, what we're mostly going to do is just implement ways to calculate these things. Also a good way to get a little bit of intuition. But those links there point to blog posts and other places to learn additional stuff about all these pieces, the surprise, the cross entropy, the KL divergence. Okay, cool. So our first bit here here is negative log probability or surprise. So in the lectures for this class, I talk a lot about this idea of the surprise as the negative logarithm of the probability, what that means, but we don't ever calculate it. So the short answer is that surprises are, it's very much like our intuitive idea of surprise. When something is unexpected, the surprise is really big. When something's impossible, the surprise is infinite. When something is certain, there is no surprise at all. So that's the, the intuition for the surprise. Um, but now let's write some Python code for the surprise. So that's this exercise here, which takes in a probability mass function as an array and an index into that array and returns the surprise, just like is written in that little block of math up there. Okay. One thing that I'm immediately a little bit surprised by is that the PMF here has function in the name, but it's being passed as an array. Is that right? Uh, should I be alarmed there? Or is that okay? Yeah, no, you're right to, you're right to at least raise alarms. They're called probability mass functions. Yeah. We've talked about the idea of thinking about arrays as functions, but this is actually distinct from that. Uh, <laughs> as well, which is an array is also a function that takes in an index and returns a value. So you give an array an index and then out comes either another array or a concrete value if you've given enough indices. And so that's the sense in which this is a function. This is the exercise that we skipped over there with talking about representing probability mass functions as arrays. Maybe just think of it as these are the numbers that sum to one. It's an array that's got the probabilities in it, and we're going to use that to calculate the surprise. Okay, so just connecting it to the lecture, am I, am I correct in saying it's like the space that you showed that was like an uneven pizza shape? And then the index is, let's say, the, the location of the pepperoni. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. It is the index is exactly the location of the pepperonis. Yeah. Okay, sweet. I'm thinking that this is the answer to this first. So I'm indexing in and then I'm calculating the log and then I'm returning the negative of that. Yep. Nice. There we go. Yeah. When you've got these functions to calculate the log and things like that for you, calculating the entropy or, or the surprises is pretty straightforward. Our goal here is to connect these ideas to machine learning. And so we're going to need some other functions here 
One that comes up in machine learning a lot is the softmax function. Machine learning models often need to produce some kind of probability distribution. So they say, what's the chance? Really what a machine learning model will tell you is what's the chance that the label of this image is dog? What's the chance that the label of this image is cat? Not just what is the label? Because there's some uncertainty there. Maybe different people would label it differently, or uh, maybe it's hard to tell whether it's a dog or a cat. Another example would be if you have a model that generates sentences like the famous GPT-3 model, it produces a probability distribution over what's going to come next. And then when we're generating sentences, we actually draw randomly according to that distribution. So in order to do this, we need to output a probability distribution at the end. So we need to output an array whose elements sum to one as our output there. And the normal way that this is done in machine learning is this softmax function, which takes an array of whatever numbers you want and turns it into an array full of values that are non-negative and that sum to one. So that can be thought of as a probability distribution whose indices tell you the probabilities of different events, like the probability it's a dog, the probability it's a cat, the probability that the next word in the sentence is world after hello. The formula for softmax is that right there. We use the exponential function to make things positive only, and then we divide by the sum to make it so that they add up to one. So those are the two steps. On the top, we turn it to positive only. On the bottom, we divide by that sum in that formula there. All right, so now let's implement this softmax function. Let's take that formula that's up there and compute the softmax. So I want to sum over the x i. Is it x? So we're getting these one dimensional rays. So you don't need to worry about which dimension you're summing over or anything like that. We're just getting an individual array here and the exponents on the top. And then NumPy does broadcasting, which means the bottom part of that returns a single number. That thing on the bottom is like mm -hmm. a normalization constant or just a single number to divide by. And we'll divide every element of the array by that same number. Okay. So the reason why we're calculating these surprises is because the surprise connects us to ideas from information theory. So the idea that you may have come across is the idea of the entropy of a random variable, the entropy of some source of randomness that in terms of its probability mass function and the surprise is just defined as take the probability mass function multiply it by the surprise for each value of the surprise and then sum those up this is also called the expected value of the surprise or uh so the expected value of a random variable is the average value of that variable if you were to take lots and lots of samples and calculate the mean it should be very close to the expected value here we're taking the average of the surprise so thinking of the surprise as a random variable so on any given draw the random variable how surprising was that particular draw how surprising was it that this image was labeled dog how surprising was it that the next word in this sentence was world after hello this entropy function has a lot of uses in in information theory in lots of different places, it's how people quantify compression. Here in machine learning, it's showing up in our loss functions. Okay, here's my formula. It's, a, it's asking me to implement a function to compute the entropy of a PMF represented by an array. Uh, I assume that means I'm supposed to be implementing this function above. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. I'm going to do mp.sum over the probabilities, and mm. then I'm going to... Oh, this is a this is maybe something surprising about the way that that notation works. So mm -hmm. actually, the sum is over i, and it gets all of the stuff to the right of it. So it's not the sum over the probability uh, or times the negative log. Okay, makes sense. So sorry, th this is like in brackets or something. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then I'm just going to do mp dot log here, and I'll figure out that. Yeah, the dot there is multiplication. So can I do mp dot dot? How does this look? Almost. So the dot there represents just regular multiplication. It just says, like, take these two individual scalar numbers and multiply them together. Oh, okay. If you've got that sum there, really what you, yeah, exactly. So that's a direct translation of what I wrote up there into code. Let's check to make sure we translated it right. Nice. Awesome. Okay. This is a great, this is a perfect answer. This is probably the way most implementations of entropy actually work, but there's actually a cool little fact here that I want to bring up. If you look at that formula again, what we're doing is we're multiplying a bunch of numbers together and summing up the results. We've got the numbers in the probability array. We've got numbers in an array of surprises and we're multiplying the entries and summing them up. That maybe sounds familiar. Going back to the linear algebra section of the course, we were really often doing things where we would multiply entries together and sum up the results, right? Yes. 
if we had the entries in one vector and the entries in another vector, and we wanted to multiply all of them together and sum up the results in a single operation, there was one operation that we used to do all of that in a single step, which was the dot the product. product. <laughs> okay. I just got that before you told me. <laughs> okay. So that's the dot of mp.log. Is that going to do it? Okay. Nice. Good. That's a cool trick. Yeah, maybe this isn't best way to implement the entropy. There's maybe more numerically stable ways to do it. There's some caveats here, but the core idea is that there actually is a really close relationship between these expected values and ideas in linear algebra. These are the expected value is a linear operation. If there's one core idea that actually unites all three of the branches of math that we're talking about in this course is that linearity is important. Linearity is central to linear algebra. It was central in calculus because we were doing these linear approximations. And in fact, even the limit is a linear operation. And now we have these expected values. They're also linear operations. Uh, so I got some advice once from a physicist friend that if I wanted to understand mathematics, I should take a long bubble bath and meditate on linearity. <laughs> and that turned out to be really great advice. Nice. I need to try that. Yeah. Um, let me know how that goes. The entropy is something that tells us the minimum number of bits required to store the values of a signal. If something varies randomly, entropy tells us no matter how good you are at compression, you're going to need at least this many bits if you want to represent it perfectly. But in order to calculate it and in order to know it, we need to know the true distribution of these random values. We need to know exactly how likely it is that each event will happen. And that's not something we generally have access to. We can train models that try and approximate it, or we can develop laws of physics that try and help us compute these things, but we're always, there's some error, there's some uncertainty. And so we don't usually actually end up getting entropies. We generally have something that's called a cross entropy. When you do a cross entropy, you calculate your surprises according to one distribution, but then you average them or you weight them according to a different one. So the idea here is my model tells me I should be this surprised by the next output in this sentence being the word world after hello. It tells me I should be two bits surprised. And then when I come across that in a data set, that adds two bits of surprise to my average. And then I loop over like a gigantic data set and I can get a guess at the cross entropy of my model, getting the true entropy of the English language much harder than estimating the cross entropy of a particular model. Okay. So sorry, just so I understand. This is like, would be like if you had access to the the real distribution of whatever you're trying to figure out. And this is like trying to approximate it with an estimation each time. Am, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, yeah. So Q here is our estimation. P is still the truth. And so to, you can estimate the cross entropy because you know how surprised you are and you can draw samples according to P. So you can estimate the cross entropy. With the entropy, it's a little bit harder to estimate because you also don't know how surprised somebody who knows the true distribution would be. The right component of our dot product, that surprise, you also don't know. So this is at least one step more known. Okay, that's a good point. Great question. Okay, now let's do the cross entropy here. Mm -hmm. And if you have P and Q as explicit values, it's even simpler to calculate this. Cool. I'm going to use your dot product trick and I'm going to do P and then it's it's the mp.log of the Q. Exactly. Nice. All right. And the grader agrees, which is good news. That's our cross entropy. Uh, it's calculated in a very similar way to calculating the entropy if you've got these distributions. So the cross entropy is what shows up in your actual neural network losses. So we're getting much, much closer to actually having a neural network loss here. You won't see it calculated with exactly this formula. You know, if you're working with, say, data with labels, the cross entropy, people use tricks to calculate it. We'll also see that if it's something like a regression problem, people replace the cross entropy formula. It's, you know, if you actually calculate this out, you'll find it turns into the squared error. It turns into the absolute error. It turns into all these other loss functions. But this is the sort of like err loss function underneath all these other ones that gives us the specific things that we compute for one machine learning model or another. Cool. So one last bit here of additional entropy calculating things is the KL divergence. The cross entropy gives us one way to measure how different two probability mass functions are. I like if Q is really far away from P, I'll get a larger cross entropy the, the more different Q is from P. But it's not quite a distance. Um, one thing that we like about distances is that a point should have a distance zero from itself. So the distance from one point to the same point should be zero. Whereas if I take the cross entropy of P with itself, I'll get the entropy. That would just be 
P times negative log P. Uh, so instead of using the cross entropy, it's often convenient to use a different quantity to measure the difference between two probability distributions, which is the KL divergence. So I gave the formula there, which is the sort of like definition formula that people often use. If you rearrange this really quickly, just take that logarithm and split it apart and turn this into two sums. You'll see that turns into divergence is equal to cross entropy minus entropy. Uh, and this is the formula I prefer to think of. If somebody asks me a question like, oh, does the KL divergence do this? Or what's the definition of the KL divergence? I immediately think, okay, it's the difference between the cross entropy and the entropy. It's the way we normalize the cross entropy down to zero. And then maybe I like unpack that definition. I unzip it into the full formula or into this more compact version that's up there. So that gives you good intuition, I think, about what this thing does. Depending on the exact application, the loss function you're using might be the cross entropy or might be the KL divergence. They only differ by this entropy term here. And depending on the derivatives you take, maybe that term has derivative zero, so it vanishes. And so sometimes it's useful to think of it as a KL divergence. Sometimes it's useful to think of your losses as coming from the cross entropy. Okay. I guess a quick question is, do you have any rules of thumb that is like when you would see one versus the other? Yeah, I guess if you're doing things that are closer to generative modeling, you're more likely to actually care about that entropy term. So with things like variational autoencoders, this okay. will still be in there. Um, there's a different kind of divergence in GANs, and that term becomes really important. But if you're doing something that's closer to supervised learning, where all you're trying to do is match your particular outputs, the particular things you've been given, that will just show you that cross entropy term. Okay, cool. Um, so it's kind of a divide between discriminative and generative modeling. That's the more old school term for those two things. But yeah, you'll always care about the cross entropy. You will sometimes care also about that entropy term. Cool, thanks. Great question. Yeah, now let's, uh, let's do a quick function to compute it. Okay, so I'm going to not use any functions like this representation. I'm going to just calculate it directly and I'm going to use your dot product trick again and going to pass in the P and then it's going to be uh, mp.log or negative mp.log of q divided by p. And I'm now wondering whether NumPy is going to let me do that. Uh, is that going to do a element wise divide or I guess we can have a check and see if it's... We can have a check for sure. I think you're right that it is that element wise divide that you want. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. In general, when you use your normal math expressions, divide times plus NumPy interprets that as I want to take all the elements of this array and like mm -hmm. add them together. Or maybe I want to add the same number to every element in this array. Uh, and it's only if you use the at the special at operator for matrix multiplication, or you use a NumPy function that's defined only for arrays like dot that you start <laughs> getting things that you know, change the shape of the array and don't just treat it as like a for loop over applying this to the elements of the array. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Now we're ready to put this together into the definition of a typical loss function in machine learning. ML models often output probability distributions and the goal of training from a galactic view is to align those probability distributions that come out of our model when it's fed with inputs with what we believe to be the true probability distribution on the basis of some samples. So we have samples of inputs and labels, and that gives us like a kind of estimate of the probability distribution. And we want our model's output distribution to match that. Another way of thinking of it is to say we want our model to be as, as little surprised as possible uh, when it encounters the data that it sees. The way we do that is by the like cross entropy and KL divergence by minimizing those things because those calculate a form of surprise when presented with data. And so what we tend to do is compute the cross entropy P based on our samples on the model's output. For data that's labeled with specific numbers, we'll actually calculate this fairly explicitly. And so we'll calculate a cross entropy of the labels on the model's output. So the one thing that stops us from directly just applying cross entropy to model output and label is that our models generally output not directly a probability mass function, but they output just arbitrary numbers, right? If I go through a linear layer, I've got, I don't have numbers that necessarily sum to one. So the usual is to sort of merge these two things together, softmax and cross entropy into one step, just so that we can connect as close as possible with PyTorch and Keras and other approaches for machine learning. I wanted to explicitly write out this softmax cross entropy combo here. And am I correct in saying that is usually referred to as the uh, negative log likelihood? loss in some of, uh, or at least in PyTorch. 
Yeah, this combination is called the negative log likelihood loss. The name has changed a couple of times, I think. And I think there's differences in convention between PyTorch and Keras. But yeah, okay. this combo goes by that name in PyTorch. And negative log likelihood is another term, another way of saying surprise. So if I were writing PyTorch, I would have tried to call it the surprise loss. That negative log likelihood terminology is a little older, a little more standard than calling it the surprise. Okay. I'm being asked to implement this. You were saying there's some tricks. I've come across one of those tricks but I'm not going to go for it now. The trick I've heard is you do the log sum exp trick where you do one of the operations first and then the other and it works out more efficient. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, there's this trick involving when you do the logarithm and the main thing there isn't actually speed, it's numerical stability oh, and yeah. being able to calculate good gradients. But let's, rather than doing that, what I want to emphasize here is that this thing here is just a combination of two things that we've already done. Um, <laughs> our softmax function, which we wrote, and our cross entropy function, which we also wrote. Cool. I'm, I'm going to do this first, and that'll give me my probabilities. I might actually just give them a name. And then with that, I'm going to do my negative log likelihood, or sorry, my cross entropy, which I'm going to do with, again, your trick, which will be probs np dot log of probs oh no so i have been passed in p so um applies that to the logic includes okay so it'll be between this and this let's go ahead and run this yep and see what the grader says oh you wrote np.softmax but we wrote the softmax function right oh okay yes true i i just assumed it, that this existed as a function but we wrote the yeah, softmax so this should do it or at least if you get a new error it'll run failed again and this says is it close so no so it didn't give me a nice error message oh check the argument order okay it did actually give me a nice error message mm -hmm. um so in that case maybe i want to have done p and he here and probs here yeah great we've placated our testing suite the explanation for why that should be the case <laughs> is that the model probabilities are what give us the surprise. So what we're trying to calculate is how surprised is our model. So that should be inside the logarithm. Whereas in order to get the average, like on average, how, how often would be, we'd be surprised if we did this over and over again, that's what we need the true distribution for this P. That's why we have probabilities from the model inside the log, probabilities from the labels, not inside the log. Okay. And then the one, the one last thing I would say is we've now re-implemented the cross entropy in a second place. And my preference would be to just reuse the definition of the cross entropy here. So that if we later decide we want to make our cross entropy function better in some way, we don't have to make that change in multiple places. Okay. Now that we're here, this isn't too bad. Oh, actually, no, I've, I did it wrong though. I should have done this. Yeah. I do like the instinct to like pull out variables and name them. It can make it more explicit what you're doing um, when somebody's reading your code later. I think that's more important than saving on lines or saving on space. Computers are big. They can hold a lot of code, but it's fairly clear here. You've just like translated the doc string into code, which is also nice and readable. So either way is fine. Cool. All right. So to close out here, I want to put all of the ideas almost in this class together to sort of like glimpse how all of this comes together in a machine learning pipeline, our linear algebra, our calculus, and our ideas from probability. What we're going to do is first, we're going to see how we go from cross entropy to a different loss function that's maybe more familiar, the squared error. And then we're going to see that taking derivatives and doing gradient descent with these two different approaches gives us the same result. Okay. Uh, and then we'll have seen a derivative, which calculates a linear approximation to a loss function given by a surprise used to train a simple ML model. The connection here, the way that we go from broad ideas about probability distributions and their cross entropies to a concrete specific loss function is through the Gaussian distribution, the normal distribution that we talked about in the lecture. So when you take the Gaussian probability distribution, the probability density function that we have here, if we take the negative logarithm of it, it takes all that stuff that's up inside the exponent and pulls it down and okay. turns it into this kind of simpler looking formula here. So we just have the difference between X and the mean value of the Gaussian distribution squared. That gives us the surprise. And this thing. Yes. Then we have, there's like a normalization constant there that makes sure that the probability 
probability density function integrates to one, that the probabilities are normalized. So we've got that in there. But then the core thing that changes as we change x or we change mu is that thing on the left. And that's okay. just a squared error. The neat thing about Gaussians is that they turn a hard problem of like, how surprised am I by this input into a simple problem, which is how far away is this value from another value, which is nice, simple function, easy to compute. Cool. We're going to implement this as a function, the Gaussian surprise that computes this value for a mean parameter mu and an array of sample values data. So data is our X here and mu is that mean parameter. So to write this one, I think this one is one that does really benefit actually from naming each piece and then adding, combining the like named pieces together. Okay. So data here is my X mm -hmm. and mu is this input. Okay. And yeah, I'm seeing Z here, but there's no normalization constant being passed in. Is this something that I'm going to have to figure out? Yeah. And actually I would recommend writing. There's some benefit to actually like writing code backwards rather than writing code the way the computer experiences it, which is, you know, a series of instructions that build up to something. Start with the code that you want to write to close this thing out, which is probably like a direct translation of that line of code up there. And then look at that line of code and be like, okay, why doesn't this run? To start off, we'll write something that maybe doesn't run. Data minus mu, and then I'm gonna do that. Yep. And then I will just ignore that other thing and see if the grader will help me. Ooh, this is, this is a fun one. The Gaussian surprise here says, take in an array of data and calculate the total surprise for having observed all of that data. Uh, and what you've done there is done the broadcasted version, which gives you the surprise for each one separately. Okay. So I want a sum of each element in these having been applied with, with these. Am I correct there? Yep. So you want the squared error done for all the data at once, and then you just want to add those up. Okay. On the outside of this whole thing. Yeah. I should be able to, I know intuitively I could do like four da 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 and I'm resisting the urge to do a loop. Actually, I'd say it is, it is nice to write the loop version and just yeah, like make sure you got the thing correct. But I think the thing you're looking for is np.sum here. Okay. Well, np.sum, I was reaching for that, but then if I do data minus mu, That'll just sum the differences and then I'm going to do the square after that. Okay. So that sums up the differences and takes the square of adding up the differences. So if I have two things, one is plus one away from you and the other is minus one away from you. If I add up the differences, I get zero and then you'd square that and get a squared error of zero. Okay. Uh, so what you I really want is to square inside the sum. Okay. I'm going to do my loop and then I'm going to figure out without the loop afterwards. Um, yeah, good idea. So I'll just do x minus y squared for x, y in zip mu data. Okay. I think maybe this is why this is maybe confusing. Mu is just going to be fixed here. Mu is just a single value being passed in. And so you actually, you don't have to zip them together or anything. Okay. That is definitely where I was confused. I think I can survive now with summing the differences. So I want to do x. Oh, well, actually I'll do, I'll do it here so I can do no zip mm -hmm. and then no mu. And I'm just going to call this X and then I'm just going to do X minus mu here. What have I done wrong now? I have a wrong bracket somewhere. So here's the bracket. Yeah. And then I also want to multiply that by 0 0.5. You got it. Let's see now. Okay. Squared errors for X equals mu is zero. So surprise is N times a half log z. I don't have log z. Exactly. So we haven't gotten to the z yet, but this suggests that we've got at least some things. We're getting the right output type is what the first mm -hmm. thing says. And then the greater equal thing is checking to make sure that the surprise is always non-negative. So like <laughs> we haven't made any too gross errors that helped us like figure out what the right data type was. Now we need to get the, the right answer. Okay. I would like to fix this as well before we go on. Yeah. Good idea. This is probably a good learning moment, as you say. Um, yeah. so uh, if I do data minus mu, mm -hmm. that'll do a element wise subtraction. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess. So mu is just a single number. So what this yeah. does is it broadcasts. It's, uh, the term is broadcasting. So it treats yeah. mu as though it were an array, exactly the same shape as data and yeah. then does element-wise subtraction. Okay, so 
this will subtract mu the scalar value from every element in data. Yes. Now I want to square all of those mm -hmm. um, values individually. So I can do, if I do this, mm -hmm. will that square all of my values independently? So then yeah. now I'll have the squared differences and then all I need to do is sum them. Okay. I'm struggling to remember. I think, oh, okay. So I just had this out here originally for my sum. Cool. That that's should, a, I think that's a really great instance of how you should think your way through some maybe difficult tensor calculations where you've got arrays and you're doing mathematical operations on them. Just break it out into a for loop and think about the components. And then once you're done and you're confident that is running correctly and giving you the right answers, then you can try and turn it into something that maybe runs more efficiently, is more like sort of Pythonic and fits the way NumPy likes you to write things while you still have that nice working example to compare to always to make sure that you're getting the right answer. Um, but yeah, I think Whenever I come across anything super difficult like that, I turn it into for loops, unroll it like that. So I can think yeah. clearly about what I'm trying to do. Especially when there's things like broadcasting. And like in that case, I figured out that I had a misunderstood, at least that this was not a um, vector. It, it does tend to find bugs that you, you, you know, you otherwise wouldn't have found. Exactly. Yeah. If you tried to for loop over mu, you would get a very clear error. That's this is a scalar. You can't for loop over that. And yeah. your shape errors will maybe be more informative. It'll be like, oh, the length, you know, you said that you wanted to loop over with a range of a particular length and then that didn't work. And you get a clear error that says, here's the shape that is wrong in what you just wrote with your for loops. It can be much more explicit. And so it's a, it's a nice way to debug, like approach your code from a different angle, maybe approach your problem from a different angle. And some things will be more clear from that direction. Cool. Okay. So we still have the issue that is this normalization constant with Z. Yeah. That I don't have access to. So my suggestion would be right now, when I said like, you know, write the code you wish you could write, would just be like plus 0.5 times log Z, right? Yeah. Log of Z. Yeah. NP dot log. Oh, yes. Okay. And this code won't run yet. So the grader is just going to be like, wait, what the hell is Z? So what we need to do is write down what Z is by going back up to the formula. Ah, I see. Okay. Z is just 2 pi. Yep. So that's something that it uh, makes sure that the thing integrates to one. You could do the integral by hand if you're that type of intrepid individual, or you can just look up these normalization constants or how to calculate them with a simpler formula, which is what I usually do. Is this the same as in university probability classes where you'll have a big log book of probabilities uh, and you have to look up that specific one for a given function? Am I, is this a different uh, thing? Yeah. So they come about for the same reason, actually. So what I'm thinking of is like, if you take a statistics class, class and you get like a value for a statistic, the T statistic or yeah. the Z statistic or whatever, then you go look up a value that tells you something like the P value or things like that on the basis of that statistic. Yes. In both cases, there is a gnarly integral that is like really hard to evaluate. And you either need an expert at evaluating integrals to tell you what those answers will be, or you need to approximate them with a computer in some way. And then in the time before you could just pass around code really easily and run it wherever you wanted, like we can now. The basic answer was, oh, we'll just write the answers down and pass those around instead. So yeah, it's, uh, I think in the end, both of them come from really gnarly, hard to evaluate integrals. That's why we look these values up. Okay, cool. So two pi here is just this number that somebody wrote down some at some time, you know, calculated by hand that we're not getting the benefit of that and plugging it into our formula. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where are we at here? The zero. So the surprise is n times half log z. Have I done that correctly? Times maybe that log pi. The one tricky bit here, I actually didn't didn't see this, is that formula up there is the surprise for one value. So we get a one half log z every single time we evaluate on a value. You could do one of two things. You could either put it inside of the sum there or you could multiply it by the number of terms in the sum, multiply it by the length of the data. Interesting. Okay. I could, so I could do that now, but I don't think I'd really understand it. Is that shown in this formula or is there some implicit I here that I'm not seeing? Yeah, there's an implicit I there. The surprise on observation XI is one half of XI minus mu squared plus one half log Z. 
or log Z. Uh, no, log, log Z. I, oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. We just put just one of these for each of the X's and I'm calculating one X. So if I did that, this is correct for like my first I. Mm. Okay, sweet. I don't have a preference of which is more elegant here. I would say maybe the length one. Happy to be wrong about that. I think that will run faster. What you would have to do otherwise is like every time, every single time you come across a data point, you're adding one half log Z. But we know that if we do that N times, what we'll get is N times one half log Z. <laughs> and so you're sort of turning, you're taking that and algebraically figuring out what the right answer is, multiply by len data and calculating it in one fell swoop instead of writing the slower code. Let's check that that's right. Yay. Great. That is a little, that is a tricky bit of that problem there, this jump to using like an entire array of data at once. So that is, that's definitely a tricky bit there. Yeah. So this one, this one here caught me up a few times that, mm -hmm. you know, between this being a scalar and then this term being also a constant that, you know, I'm, hey, I should have, should have noticed it up there, but I didn't. And then also that it's not just a constant, this added in it for, for the whole, it's for every single value of X. So yeah, yeah a couple of tricks, but you helped me through it. Yeah. Maybe another way to organize these exercises would be to do it for one data point, then do it for all the data at once. So split this up into two exercises. Yeah. Or, or have you alongside helped me through it? That's the other way to do it. So we're trying to connect this to machine learning models and you aren't going to find a Gaussian surprise function like we just wrote in TensorFlow or PyTorch anywhere. What you'll find instead is something that calculates something like the squared error. This one's much more straightforward to write because there aren't those confusions about constants or anything like that. I just, no, okay, I need to do the difference. That'll be yep. applied to each value, then squared, then summed together. Yeah. Nice. Sick. So this is what you'll more commonly see things like the mean squared error and the sum of squared errors when people are actually writing out their loss functions when they're writing out their code. But where that came from is that came from that Gaussian surprise. They differ in their actual numerical, the like output values, right? Because there's no log Z in this second one. But if you take a gradient, Z never changes as you change mu. So that just vanishes when you take a gradient. And so they all they differ by is by a factor of one half. There's that one half at the beginning of the Gaussian surprise. If you scroll up just a little bit, it's one half times the squared error or the squared difference. And so that stays around in the gradient. So the scales of the gradients are different. And, you know, we use learning rates to change the scales of our gradients all the time. So the scale is not that meaningful. So these really are, once it comes time to do optimization, these are effectively the same function, the sum of squared errors and the Gaussian surprise. And this just shows you that what I'm saying is correct here, that if I take a gradient descent step using that Gaussian surprise function you implemented, I get the same answer if I do it with the sum of squared errors instead down there in that last assert block there is saying that these two gradient descent steps give you the same answer. And it's because the, the half learning rate. Exactly. Nice. And just like scaling the gradients does not change what the best value is. So at the optimum, the gradients are zero. So multiply them by a half doesn't change anything. It's still zero. So the optima still stay the same. The goal of our optimization still stays the same, whether we're using the sum of squared errors or the Gaussian surprise. Let's demonstrate that by writing a run gradient descent. And then the way I'm gonna check that you implemented gradient descent correctly is I'm gonna check that it gives the same answer when optimizing mu for both the Gaussian surprise and the sum of squared error. I didn't give you a definition of gradient descent here. I guess I gave you the GD step there. So you yeah. can reuse that function, which does a lot of the work. But it's, it's what we learned, I think, in a different class where it's the step in the opposite direction of the gradient by a given learning rate. Yeah, and that is one step of gradient descent. So all you need to do to run gradient descent is not just take one step, but take many steps. Yeah. Okay. So this would be like your epoch number where in each step or in e each epoch, we evaluate the gradients for all of the data. Usually that's done in mini batches, but in this case, I gather we'll be doing it per element in the data. I would say rather than doing mini batches or doing it element wise, the GD step expects to get an array of data. And oh, so okay. let's do the GD step. For N steps. For N steps. Yeah. For in N steps or range of N steps. I don't actually need the 
steps and then I'm going to call gradient descent and it's going to return something which is going to be my my new value for or the parameter mu so mu here is the parameter of this Gaussian distribution. And it's like the parameters of our model, because once you have that parameter, you know the probability distribution over the outputs. Just like once you have the parameters of a neural network, you also have a probability distribution over the outputs. And so that mu there is our parameter. And I guess I would focus in terms of like writing the next line here, I would focus on just the API of GD step. Like you're yeah. gonna expect those four things there. Okay, I'll just print them down here so I have them. So mu zero is that, data is the same, f is the same, learning rate is also passed in. I'm using n steps here, and then I want to update, which that's fine. So I'm now re renaming that, and then I'm going to keep doing that. After n steps, I'll now have like a, a mu zero that was updated 10 times, and mm -hmm. then I'm going to return that value. Yep, let's see. Yay. Got it. The only thing I might change about the way you implemented that function is I might give an alias to mu uh, yeah. zero, like call it mu t equals mu zero at the start. Or or even this would be probably, at least then it's not saying it's the zero. Like, I, I don't know why. Are you keep Why would you keep around a mu zero? I put it in the API of the function just because I think of the names of arguments in my functions as a way to communicate to the person calling my function what I'm expecting. So calling it mu zero tells them, hey, I am expecting the starting value of mu. And then if I need to rename that or change something about it in the body of the function, I'm happy to do that. I want the name in the doc string in the function signature to be as like communicative as possible to the person calling my function. Okay. And do I need to copy it if I'm going to do that? Or does NumPy copy it for me? Mu T will just be a view on the same array. You'll be overwriting it. So it might be polite, actually, to copy mu zero. In case maybe someone's passing this in and using it later for some... And then also using it later, yeah. So these are the kind of rough, tough things about implementing a good version of gradient descent and a good version of like your machine learning models and their parameters that are why you don't want to write gradient descent yourself, you know, and you don't want to write your neural network library from scratch, like yeah. in terms of what you actually use, but it's I think good it, to do it at least once. Yeah, that's true. I feel like using Autograd here is at least saving us a lot of pain that at least we don't have to implement the grading step ourselves. But mm. yeah, you're, you're, you're right that it's nice that training loops exist in, in packages and you don't have to think about it. But in order to be able to like make use of those effectively and to debug them, it's really useful to go through an exercise like we've done in the course of this whole class, actually, and think through where are all of these ideas coming from and what would be the basic bare bones implementation of a bunch of these things like calculating a gradient, like running gradient descent or doing all these linear algebra operations, writing these things out in maybe forms that are not very numerically stable, are maybe not very efficient, but are easy for us to understand and give the same answer. And then you can take that intuition and run with it to be able to understand the stuff that's actually useful that's out there in like PyTorch and Keras. I completely agree. Great. I'm glad. And hopefully the folks uh, enjoying this course from home also agree. I gave some recommendations for additional exercises or, or, or resources for learning math for machine learning in the lecture, but I would close out just our exercise video series by saying, if you want to really understand this stuff, there's no substitute for like building a toy basic version of these things yourself. And some of the resources I pointed to help you do that. Programmer's Introduction to Mathematics by Jeremy Kuhn is a good example. Build Your Own X on GitHub is another one. These are great places to try that and really get comfortable with these things and become, in the end, more comfortable with the machine learning models and tools you're building. All right. Thanks a lot, Scott, for working through all these exercises with me. Uh, you've been a really great sport as I've trapped you in my little learning traps, and uh, you've done a great job. Thanks. I've learned a lot.